Have you ever dreamt of discovering your own species? I often think about that when I walk through here, whether there's something undocumented just right there. Well, last week we met Dr. Russell Barrett from the Royal Botanic Garden, Sydney, and he has discovered a ton of new species, but there's one in particular which caught my attention. I guess going back now, it's now almost 10 years ago, we were, uh, flew into a remote location up in the Kimberley region where I do a lot of work. I uh, actually grew up in the Kimberley region, up in the remote cattle station. And so we flew out of Derby to the remote Harding Range, which is about 200 kilometres away. Uh, it's an area that hasn't got any roads going to it. And so really going in by helicopter is the only way. And we're also going in the wet season when most of the roads in the Kimberley are closed because uh, they're mostly dirt roads. And so we flew into this remote area, uh, into the Harding Range, because we knew no, no one collected in there particularly not in the wet season um, and that was one of the things we were targeting was going into areas where no one had looked just to see if we could find new species and document what's there and so we were out there collecting everything we could come across and one of the things we found was this small uh, mauve coloured flower that we immediately recognised as a, a Leshenaltia but it wasn't one we were familiar with the Kimberley only had one recognised Leshenaltia species which is with a dark blue flower so the flower colour, size and orientation is immediately quite different. And so it was then interesting to, to look around and realise that the flower was actually growing with another species that wasn't related to it but happened to look incredibly similar. And so actually looking at the orientation and comparing the two side by side, we're actually able to recognise that well actually there's a very strong uh, convergence of features there and it's almost certainly a case of pollination driven mimicry which is quite remarkable between a member of the fan flower family, the Godiniaceae, where mimicry hasn't been um, recorded previously in this uh, manner, and a species of Lindernia, which is only found in the Kimberley region. Um, and so there's one widespread Leshenaltia, and then this turns out to be a very short range endemic. So we've only found it at two sites, um, a couple of kilometres apart, and seen over two years in 2007 and 2008. And those are the only opportunities we've had to go into that area. Now we landed a few other sites where we didn't find it, and so it's uh, quite unknown as to just how far the species goes, but it's likely to be quite a localised endemic species. Mm. And so you mentioned that it's pollinator driven? Is that So that's our understanding, that's yeah. uh, the, the best explanation we have. Unfortunately going in there in a helicopter in the wet season, our time is very limited, um, so on the two, two occasions we've had to see this species in the field, we were at the site for only about an hour each, and mm -hmm. in that time we were collecting other things and we didn't observe any pollinators on this particular species. So at the moment we still have to speculate, um, but the, the number of features that are, uh, have converged between these two plants means that's almost certainly the case. So to really prove that this is mimicry, someone needs to go back out to this site when they're flowering and actually watch the pollinators and observe the same pollinator visiting the same flowers. Um, but obviously there's a fairly difficult logistics in getting out yeah. there and spending the time necessary to make those observations. Personally, I think it's just incredible that a species can exist in such a small pocket. But if you think it's almost impossible to find a new species, don't give up because it turns out some of the greatest mysteries are in some of the species we thought we knew everything about. And also, I'm just going to show you these mushrooms. I just saw these mushrooms. Can you see? Look at that. I'm guessing there's fungus decomposing this dead tree. But just to bring us back on track, in 2013, the botanist Ernesto Gianoli was walking in the forests of southern Chile. Immersed in his world of green, he took note of every plant as he passed, looking carefully at its flowers, its leaves, its shape and its colour. Eventually he came to a common shrub and was admiring its waxy leaves. But then he realised that the leaves in his hand didn't belong to the plant. They looked identical, 
but these leaves came from a vine wrapped up around the shrub. He looked closer and identified the vine as Bequilla trifoliolata. Nothing special and relatively common. It had been studied for hundreds of years. But its leaves didn't normally look like this. Ernesto and his student began looking around the area, and they soon realised that they were surrounded by the vine. Every tree or plant it grew on, it was mimicking the leaves of its host. Dynamic mimicry. Even the single vine was mimicking different leaves, depending on the plant which surrounded it at that height. And so I asked Dr. Barrett, what does this discovery mean for our understanding of mimicry? And what does it mean even for our understanding of plants themselves? Yeah, Bacrilla trifoliolata is a very interesting species and it's one which really raises questions about just how adaptable plants are, how responsive they are to their environment and the potential for communication between individuals of plants even when they're not the same species. And so there are interesting known chemical signals that particularly species of um, African acacia, the thorny acacias, um, have for signaling when, when one is being eaten, they've re released chemicals into the air that then cause their neighboring trees to, to fold up their leaflets so they're less attractive to herbivores. So there's communication signals known between individuals of the same species like that. But this is a really interesting species in that it's adapting as it's coming into close proximity with various other species around it and varying its leaf morphology to match the leaves of those species that it's in closest proximity to. And so that's just a, a staggering thing that it's able to do that. And it really raises a lot of questions as to how, whether that is um, something to do with the amount of light it's getting in particular situations. And so there is the potential that at a micro habitat scale, particular species are growing with a certain amount of light. And so leaves become a certain size and certain shape into, in response to the amount of light they're getting in that particular spot. And so um, the fact that you can get such differently shaped leaves on that species as you move along its stem, as it's moving through an individual, through a particular environment, um, one option is that it's lighting um, response, but that's unlikely to involve um, explain the level of complexity you get in that one species. And so we expect that there's a lot more to it than that, um, but the extent to which it's able to, I guess, get a signal in some way from the, the plant it's growing next to, we really don't understand how that might be occurring. It's almost the, some of the, the mimics, some of the, the patterns are almost as if you can see exactly what the neighbouring leaf looks like and reshape itself to look like that simply through being in proximity to it. Um, and that, that's just a staggering thought. Um, and so we really need a lot more research to really get our heads around some of the mechanisms that might be going on. Um, and so, as I said, there are factors with light, there's factors with moisture, factors with exposure um, that could be influencing these things. And so there might be simple underlying environmental factors that are driving these, but to find that much plasticity within uh, such a short range of branches within an individual of a species is quite remarkable. Um, there are other examples which head in that direction. In uh, uh, New Zealand flora, there's an example just in the far northern tip of New Zealand where individual plants of a species take on very different forms but to match um, very closely species that they're growing next to and that's thought to be a response to herbivory that they're growing next to plants which don't taste nice and they do taste nice um, so the thought there is that the different individuals are uh, growing and looking like a species that doesn't taste good that's in close proximity um, but you can have in some cases three or four different things that they're looking like and growing with that are co-occurring 
and so that level of complexity is, is, com is difficult enough to understand how, how and why does it match with any one of these um, and there's been thought of well, how long has this been going on for could these things have actually differentiate into different species or is it one species which is managing to mimic several different species at once so again those are questions we don't, don't have the answers to uh, but understanding patterns like that which are probably more fixed um, might give us then clues as to how this species that is having this show, demonstrating this variation within an individual and varying as it grows close to other species around it which have no relationship to it from an evolutionary point of view um, it's looking at some of, some of these other examples of physical mimicry that might give us clues to understanding how that kind of mimicry might have evolved but there's, there's so many questions that remain unanswered um, that are really exciting um, the research project yeah. do, you, do you think that mycorrhizal networks and, and fungus could have a role to play in the communication and it could be um, getting information underground? There is potential for that. It's something we're really only beginning to understand how common that might be. At the moment it's still thought to be very rare, but we know it is possible where you get that mycorrhizal association for there to be an exchange of genetic material through cell walls. Um, and so DNA from the plant can get into the mycorrhiza and where that mycorrhiza is also the same individual is connected to another plant species it's a quite a complex chain of events and it's thought to be very rare um, and very few cases have been proven absolutely um, but we know the more plant genomes we, we're developing where we're getting the entire genome we are getting these small fragments of DNA that are shared between plants and fungi and vice versa and the bits which are shared are quite often uh, functional DNA bits. So there's a, because they have a specific function, there's a reason that if it gets into a plant cell from a fungus, that it might then be replicated in the plant cell. And so it's pure speculation at this point, but it could be that the bit of DNA from one species that's cause, ex, causing the plant to express a very particular um, leaf shape and that probably has originated through level of light and level of moisture uh, level of risk of exposure to drying out um, that's most commonly why leaves are shaped the way they are it is possible that, that functional bit of DNA has actually been exchanged with another species through a mycorrhizal network and because it's functional DNA it could then replicate in that species and there is the possibility that it's being expressed um, because a lot of these functional portions of DNA have many copies throughout the genome um, and so you might have very similar genes which do result in leaf gene expression and leaf shape so you've got 10 copies of this gene that are each slightly different in the one species some of those might have originated from a different species but if they are expressed depending on the level of light or moisture available, that is a potential explanation for why you might get leaves in this situation, which happens to be next to another species, expressing a very particular morphology. And this one, which is a little bit further up, just in a slightly different shade or moisture environment, might then express the leaf morphology of another species next to it. So if that's the case, the level of sharing of genetic information, the number of connections you would have to have between these micro, between the mycorrhiza would be a phenomenal um, combination of genetic processes to explain that. And so you'd look at that and go, well, on basic probability, that's probably not the answer. But we can't rule it out either. Um, and clearly it's an incredibly rare example in the plant world. And so you ask the question, could it have happened on this one occasion? Maybe it has. Um, and so there are things which we really need a lot more information to really understand. 
the isolation of the specific genes responsible for all of these expressions are very complex. We're really only scraping the surface in terms of our understanding of that level of expression and we then need to go through and sequence the entire genomes of multiple individuals of all these things around it, of the genomes of all these mycorrhizal associations, even just to test whether these ideas are even possible. Um, and so there's a lot of work behind the scenes that we'd, we'd need to go through to test those ideas. Um, but it's a kind of research project which would be really exciting, um, even if we end up just proving that no, that's not the case. Mm. So it seems like there is a ton of new things to discover in the world of mimicry, whether it's a new species or just trying to understand the ones we already know of. If you want to hear more from Dr. Barrett, you should check out his blog, The Plant Press, or listen to his interview on the Royal Botanic Gardens podcast, Branch Out. There's an awesome one where he discusses Australian mistletoes, uh, who have some really cool examples of mimicry themselves. Um, so check that out in the links below. And I just wanted to say thanks again to the gardens and Dr. Barrett. Next week will be the last video on plant mimicry as we look at how certain species have hidden from us and how we have impacted upon them. So subscribe to catch that and I'll see you then. So have a good one. Thanks heaps. Bye.